Hi, I'm Mikkel. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I work for Bootlin, uh, which is uh, formerly a free electrons. Um, I've been quite active uh, recently in the NAN subsystem. That's why I'm going to show you today uh, the new interface that has been merged recently to handle uh, NAN flash. Um, I live in Toulouse in France, so please excuse my French accent. I will try to do my best. So I decided to start. Uh, actually, I, I wanted to show you the, the stack in Linux. But while I was writing the slides, I found it was kind of boring to spend an hour on that. So I decided to add a bigger part about the physical aspects of non-memories. Uh, but then I will, show, I will uh, explain uh, how non-flashes are, uh, are linked to your SOC and how you can control them using this interface, execop. So before starting, I'm not a non-expert. Um, I will probably simplify aspects about the physical part. Uh, and I will focus on SLC NAND, which, is, uh, which, which, which stands for single level cell. Today, there are other technologies, MLC or TLC, that can embed more than one bit per memory cell. But to simplify things, I will stick to uh, SLC today. So before the technical aspects, just some commercial information. NANs were once designed to replace hard disk drives. And you can find them. Uh, they are widely uh, spread in uh, consumer electronics, like uh, USB sticks, SSDs, and SD cards, and so on. And they come, they come under different flavors. Uh, so the one I just talked about are managed NANs. Uh, you don't see it's a flash. It's a NAND inside. Uh, you, you just see it as a, a way of storing data. And I will speak about uh, raw NANs only. Uh, also called parallel nands. So let's start with the, the explanation of how a non memory cell works. Well, I'll start deep into the matter with the silicon atom you can see here on the screen. It, embed, it has uh, 14 electrons and also 14 uh, protons. The electrons are spread across three orbits. The external one is called the valence shell, where are the valence electrons. Each of these four valence electrons will bind with another valence electron of another atom. And four, uh, one silicon atom will bind with four other silicon atoms. It makes the crystal. Uh, the crystal is, so, is electrically neutral, and um, you won't have any electricity in it unless at least it would be a complete insulator at zero Kelvin. But in our world, uh, if, for instance, light strikes uh, an electron on the valence shell, it will absorb a quantum of energy and jump to the upper orbit, the conduction band. There it will drift randomly in the matter. And if you would apply a, uh, vo a voltage across the matter, it will create, uh, you would have electricity. So to make this state permanent, people invented doping. Doping is about adding impurities in the silicon crystal. I mean, uh, if you add other atoms than silicon in a pure crystal, uh, these, if these atoms have either one more or one less electrons on their valence shell, you will have either one electron that will be free or you will lack an electron uh, on, the, on the binding uh, atoms. So it's end-doping when you have one more electron because it's uh, a negative charge that moves, and p-doping for positive uh, when you have a hole. That means you, uh, your atom is only bound to three other um, uh, at silicon atoms and uh, four, actually four, and one of the, these uh, atoms will have a, a free electron, which, is, which aims to bind with another one, but cannot. If you put side by side these two regions, N and P regions, uh, you create a diode. 
Electrons cro uh, close to the junction will jump into the P substrate and combine into holes in the P substrate close to this, ju this junction. It makes this um, area of uh, the, the P substrate electrically uh, not, not natural. And same on the other side. And it creates a small electric field that will prevent other electrons to combine with other holes a bit further. If you apply a voltage across the diode, well, if you apply a positive voltage on the, on the end side, electrons will be attracted, but uh, you, you won't have any current. However, if you apply a positive voltage on the P side, the electrons that were close to the junction will jump from hole to hole until they get out of the circuit, freeing the holes close to this junction, junction letting other electrons from the end substrate to jump across that barrier. And there you have a current. So this is the basic of uh, the MOSFET, the tr uh, transistor uh, which is made of uh, in, in the center, it's a metal oxide semiconductor uh, area because you have one leg in, which is uh, conductive, an, insulate, an insulator which is uh, the, oxide, the oxide, and then the P substrate, the semiconductor. If you apply a voltage across the external legs, you won't have any current. But if you also apply a positive voltage on the gate, which is the leg in the middle, um, positive charges will go on the, on the gate and will repeal other positive charges in the bulk, letting a small channel, uh, letting the, elect the electrons from one end side going through the other end side, jumping over the P substrate through a thin channel. So this is the basic of a uh, transistor, but we all agree that you cannot store data with that. That's why people added an extra floating gate. This extra floating gate is surrounded by an insulator, uh, still the same oxide. And if you do the same thing as before, I mean applying a voltage across the external legs and also a positive voltage on the gate, uh, you will still have your thin channel of electrons moving from one end side to the other. However, if you have a lot of electrons in the floating gate, you'll have a big, negative, uh, b uh, a big amount of negative charges that will attract the holes from the P substrate and kind of create a big positive barrier that electrons could not jump over anymore. And this way, you actually have a zero because you don't have any current anymore through the, trans through the, the MOSFET, through the transistor. So when there is no current, we call that a zero. And if I go back one slide, when you have a current that is flowing through the, the transistor, it's, it's a one. So what you have to ask right now is, okay, but the floating gate is surrounded by an insulator, so how do you put charges into the floating gate? And this is quantum mechanics. It's called the fallen or dime tunneling effect. Uh, it's when you apply a very high positive voltage on the gate that will attract and, and help, tunnel, uh, help electrons tunnel through the oxide layer until they get into the floating gate. Uh, please notice that the oxide on the top is a bit thicker than the one at the bottom, so electrons could jump from the substrate into the floating gate, but not from the floating gate to the, the metal gate. That's how uh, you program a cell to a zero state. In the other way around, if you apply a high negative voltage on the gate, um, putting a lot of electrons on the gate will repeal the, the electrons uh, that are trapped into the floating gate back into the substrate. And that's how you erase the cell. 
So this is a much simpler view of this exact same transistor. You still have the floating gate in the middle. If I put two cells like that side by side, um, I should have an NPN, then another NPN region on uh, my substrate. But instead of doing that and adding a wire between two N regions, what, what a hardware designer did is to only take one P substrate and insulate and, add, and dope N regions regular at regular intervals, so that your layout is much uh, smaller and you can have much more uh, cells in this on the same uh, silicon area. Just a side note: when you have like this two cells side by side in series, if you want a a logic zero uh, on the right side, uh, you have to apply a logic one on both gates so that this uh, point would be at the ground. And this, is, this makes, uh, if you put a one and a one, then you get a zero. This is the NAND gate, right? That's why we call this kind of uh, memory uh, NAND memory cell. So two cells is good, but not good enough to store actual data. So what we do is we create uh, strings of, of non-memory cells, in series, of course. You can go up to 32, maybe 64 uh, cells in series. The only thing, uh, the only thing is uh, to, to cross a diode, you must apply about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts across it. So the more cells you put, the more higher voltage you will need to, 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 to make a current passing through all the transistors. So how do we read one, bit, uh, one cell, one bit from, one, from this string? Um, just applying a positive voltage on the gate, as we've done before, is not enough, because if the other transistors in the same string are not passing, you won't have any current any, anyway. So what we do is applying a higher voltage on the other gates, not that high, otherwise you would produce the uh, tunneling effect, that's not what we want, but high enough so that these, um, these transistors will be passing anyway, no matter the, if they are charged or not in the floating gate. And that's how you can read one cell from a string. If you put a lot of cells in parallel, there you have absolutely no uh, limitations on that. Uh, you get what we call in, with our terms, a block. Uh, for those who, be, who are uh, quite uh, uh, who are used to, to, to manage non-flashes, uh, it's called, uh, yeah, you know the terms blocks and pages. A page is actually uh, a row of, uh, of cells connected uh, by, their, um, by, the, by their gate. So when you want to select one bit, you actually select the whole page. That's why you can only uh, program and uh, read one page at a time. I lied to you a bit uh, before. Actually, to erase a cell, you do not apply a high negative voltage on the gate because it's uh, kind of difficult to create uh, in the metal systems, and we already need a high positive voltage. So instead, we apply the high positive voltage on the bulk. It has the same effect of uh, attracting electrons uh, into, back into the substrate. However, one, the, the bulk is shared across all the cells in one block. That's why non-memories, uh, when you want to erase non, non uh, Non cells, you have to do it blocks per block. Yeah. So, uh, this is a bit to sum up. You cannot program a cell uh, to a one state, you can only program it to a zero state. And if you want to erase a cell, you have to erase a wall block. And so, you have to erase the wall block before writing the page inside it. You can feel that this design is a bit fragile. Um, depending on the positive levels, 
uh, you choose, you will have a foreign nodeIM effect, which will be strong or weak. Uh, you can have, uh, yeah, there are several flows in the designs. And uh, let me explain a few of them. So bit flips, uh, everybody knows what it is. It's you're writing, uh, uh, you're, you're writing a bit, you expect a value, and when you read it, actually you don't have the value you expected. Um, if, for instance, the, the cell was not fully erased or programmed, it happens because some of the electrons that tunnel through the oxide won't get it to the floating gate and will get trapped into the, uh, the insulator. This creates a small, um, a small negative area that will repeal some electrons to tunnel through the oxide and will prevent the, to, the cell to be programmed. There is also data, reta data reta retention issue. It means um, you, write your, your, you write a page, you put your NAND aside for a few months, maybe years, and when you take it back, you don't read the data you, you wrote. That's because when tunneling, some electrons collided with the material and damaged it. So it kind of creates some path between the floating gate and the P-substrate. And that's why uh, with time, some electrons will get back into the substrate and you will lose the, the, charge you, the charges you put in your, the floating gate. And finally, uh, obviously, uh, read and write disturbances. Uh, you remember the string uh, where you have to apply high voltages on all the gates to read one cell. Of course, uh, tunneling is a stochastical effect. You, you cannot know how, if, uh, if other electrons will go in, will enter the, 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 the floating gates, you don't want to modify. So yeah, it's, you can do this uh, read and write, write and erase cycles about 100,000 uh, times for an SLC NAND. It's much less for MLC NAND, actually. And that's all for the physical part. Um, now you know how we know how um, a non-cell work, and let's think about just the non-chip now and how you can wire it in your, uh, in your design. You do this for parallel NANDs, of course, through the use of the non-controller. The non-controller is wired to your non, uh, your non-chip is wired to you, to your non-controller. Uh, through a NIO bus, which is either 8 or 16 bit wide. And there are a lot of uh, logic around it, around them. Um, I'll start with the lines at the top. The chip enable line is here to select one chip. Uh, the host, the non controller, will select a chip. Actually, it could select a die because uh, you can see die as a logical non chips in one package. But for our examples, let's say there is only one, uh, one die in our chip. And uh, the ReDeBuzzy pin, it works in the other way around. Uh, it tells the host that the non-chip is ready or not. And uh, maybe he, it is processing some, some commands and need more time. The write protect uh, line is here to prevent so any uh, loss of data. Uh, so the non-chip won't accept any erased nor program operations. I will go back uh, on the last remaining lines. Just I want uh, to show you the, how works the non-protocol. It's only uh, three type of cycles that can happen on the IO bus. The command cycles, the address cycles, and the data cycles. Uh, data can go, obviously, in both ways while address and commands are always sent by the, the host, the non-controller. Um, that's uh, how we use these lines. CLE stands for Command Latch Enable. It means a command is being sent by the host controller, by the non-controller. Uh, ALE stands for Address Latch Enable. 
and uh, read enable, write enable, the last two lines are here to inform uh, who will talk on the bus if it's either the non-controller or the non-chip. So putting together non-destructions, you get a non-operation to achieve a, a real goal like reading something. These are, these are examples. Um, to read, the, no, let's start with the, the simplest one, the reset. If you want to reset the chip, it's just a matter of sending a command which is 30. Uh, no, it's uh, FF, sorry. And then wait for the non-chip to be ready again. And that's all. For a bit more, the, the read page is a bit more complex. You'll have to send the zero command, one command cycle, then a few address cycles. So the, the first command cycle tells the chip, OK, I want to read something. I will read the page, actually. Uh, then you send it, you send it um, address cycles to tell it where you want to read. The 30 byte, uh, the second command cycle is here to tell the chip to the chip, uh, okay, now you can go into the, the, the actual NAND and bring the data into your local cache. At this moment, the chip will assert the buzzy pin, so you'll have to wait for the operation to finish. And once this is finished, uh, the host controller will assert the write enable uh, line. So the non chip will send the data through the bus to the non controller. These controllers uh, come into a very large, uh, uh, there are a few, uh, many flavors of them. Some are really simple. Now they tend to be more complicated, more sophisticated. The main job is to talk to the non-chip, but more and more they embed uh, additional logic like uh, error correction code, ECC, to handle directly the bit flips, and also some advanced logic to enhance uh, the, thru uh, th the throughput. So let's see now how it's uh, handled uh, in the Linux kernel. This is the um, MTD stack, uh, memory technology device stack. Uh, you pro probably already heard about uh, UBI and UBIFS. It's the file system level. I won't talk about it today. Uh, you, your, your request will go through the MTD layer, which abstracts the type of flash. It can be no or none, spy, row, anything. If it comes to NAND, to NAND, to parallel NAND, uh, it will go through the NAND core also. And then the NAND core will translate the, the instructions from the MTD layer into uh, some understandable uh, request to the controller drivers. So let's see how it was done until recently. We used a lot of hooks to achieve that. Um, and uh, who has already uh, been into the non-subsystem here? Please raise your hand just to, okay, only one person, two, three, okay. So these are the hooks that are usually uh, uh, implemented in the non-core, uh, the non-controller drivers. Um, common funk is the one in the non uh, layer, non core layer. It was supposed to handle all the, uh, the command and address cycles. And it calls one hook from the controller driver, which is called command control, and send it uh, each time one command or one address cycle. And that's all. Uh, other hooks from the controller drivers were used, like wait for or dev ready to wait for the ch non chip to be ready. Uh, also, uh, various hooks, uh, read and write, byte, word, or buff, to retrieve or write uh, data. But this approach has some limitations. Um, the non controllers have become more and more complex, and uh, started, uh, old ones could just send uh, independent cycles, command, address, or data cycles, with no, no problem. New ones started to 
aggregate all of that in order to enhance the throughput, for instance. And, well, it's not a big issue to... Uh, these hooks cannot handle uh, this kind of operation, but that's not an issue. The, the, the non-controller can still be driven by uh, these hooks. But some controllers um, started, to, started to not implement the possibility to send only one command or one address cycle. So developers started to overload command func from the controller driver. And uh, now we have plenty of different implementations of that hook. That's a bit annoying. Because uh, first, when you have to re-implement something that should be in the core, that was in the core, you have a lot of uh, situations to handle. And people just supported their, their own uh, use case. The logic, because it changes from one driver to the other one, cannot be changed as easily as we would like. Um, Non-vendors still add new um, new operations, uh, if we trust Boris Brazilian, which is a current non-maintainer. But we cannot add the support for these operations because it would be too much trouble handling all the different implementations of common, common func. And most importantly, something which is really, really dangerous, drivers uh, started to predict what the next move of the core would be, because common func does not provide the I.O. length. You cannot know from common func how much data you will have to read or write. And people started uh, yeah, thinking what would be the, the length of the, of the data, uh, data move. It, it's a clear symptom that the non-core did not fit anymore the needs. I, I'm pretty sure it fit the needs at the very first beginning, at, at the very beginning, um, when controllers were quite simple, but not anymore. So that's why we introduced Execop. This interface is uh, in the non-core, and like common func and the other uh, hooks before, it aims to translate MTD requests into non-operations. Uh, we truly believe that it will fit most of the non-controllers available today. Uh, the, it, it has been merged in the 4.16 kernel and uh, the Marvel non-controller is already converted. The FSMC 1.2 and uh, some others are really close to be or we, it's, it's on the roadmap. So how does it work? Well, from the controller driver point of view, you will receive an array of instructions that makes the overall operation. That's the difference with before. Your driver will have to split um, the operation into sub-operation if needed, if it cannot handle the wall block. And if it cannot handle at all the operation, uh, it will return an error. That wasn't done before, neither. So maybe in the near future, the non-core could, could take over and try with a, another operation to do the same thing. There are multiple ways to do the same thing, same things with the non-protocol. So for simple controllers, it's just a matter of looking at each instruction and executing it one by one, and that's all. But for more complex controller, we introduced a parser. The parser is here to, to make the logic much more simple and let the non-core be clever, not the non-drivers. And the way to implement it is to, to fill an array of supported patterns. Each pattern is an array of instructions, non-instructions, and a callback. This is a simple example of uh, what it could be. The first pattern is a command and can support a command up to five address cycles and up to 1K of data move. 
The second one can handle either a command cycle and or a uh, wait cycle. And the third one can only handle uh, 1K uh, up to 1024 uh, bytes of data. So for if, for instance, you want to reset your chip uh, with this kind of, uh, uh, of driver, you will give to the non-core, to the parser, both the operations that were given to you by the non-core and the, 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 the parser uh, array, the, the, the patterns you support, so that the parser will go through all the supported patterns, find a match, and execute the callback, and that's all. And it makes the logic from the controller driver really, really simple. So in our case, uh, the reset uh, command could be handled directly by the second pattern. Um, the second, the read ID, could be handled by the first one with no problem. Even if there is only one address cycle, we don't care. We can handle up to five address cycles in this one, so it's okay. But the last one is a bit trickier. Um, there is no pattern that will handle directly the wall operation. So the parser will split it into three chunks. The first one will, ha will be just the command cycle on both uh, address cycles. And the first pattern will handle it. Then probably the second callback will be, uh, will be used to send just the second command cycle. And finally, you will use the third callback to send the data. But it will be called twice because in this example, uh, you can handle only uh, 1K of data at a time. So this is uh, how Execop is supposed to work. Uh, that's all for this interface, but I found interesting to give you a bit more, uh, at least two other, um, two other hooks or helpers that you have to implement from your, um, your controller driver. So the execop is one of them, but you also have uh, the setup data interface, which is here to change timings from the controller side, because of course you can handle a non-chip at different speeds, and it's important that both your non-controller and your non-chip will run at the same speed. And the last one is select chip, which is a a way to select uh, the non die actually, not the entire chip. And uh, it's for simple controllers, it will be just uh, the handling of the, the pin that selects the chip, but you can also maybe change the timings if you have multiple chips in parallel, uh, if you are not using the same timings for all the chips. And yeah, that's why for the, that's all for the, for the MTD stack. If some people want to help migrate it, to migrate these drivers, they are welcome. Uh, just a few a few tips, maybe um, you can use the you should use the user space utils now, not the one in the kernel. There are modules that do the same things, but they are deprecated and will might be removed quite soon. And yeah, don't, do not hesitate to read the documentation, even if there is almost none, or it's really, really, deep, really old. So I would suggest you instead to contact us on the mailing list, and please do not forget the non-maintainer. It makes him in a bad mood when he has to read the whole list. And that's all. Uh, if you are more, if you are inter interested in. Uh, the non-framework, I suggest you to, to have a look to the talk of Boris Brazilian uh, in Berlin in 2016. And also at the talk of Arnaud van der Kappel, which is about the physics of the non-memories. It goes much more in detail. Uh, it was the same year in Berlin. And yeah, thank you very much for your attention. If you have... <laughs> if you have any questions. I'd be pleased to answer. Yep. Yep. Yes.
Oh, what kind of security yeah. did we implement in the parser? Yeah. Um, we do all the check in the non-core, so both in the parser and the, the functions that will call your functions from the non-controller driver. Uh, so you, should have, you shouldn't have to worry about uh, uh, all of these errors from the controller driver. It has already been checked in before, uh, in both in the parser and in the non-read and non-functions that are in the core, supposedly. Any other question? Okay, well, thank you.